good evening everyone welcome to this webinar like every friday uh, we spend one hour you know talking to a fund manager trying to understand new things today's topic is equally interesting year 2022 seems to be a difficult year and uh, you know it is the year that seems to be a year of correction and correction you know is a positive english word so you know market is also giving lot of i would say scope for investors to correct their portfolio at the same time you know the levels are getting corrected and hence learning is important so the topic for this particular webinar is to actually try and deep dive with data and understand that whether making smarter decisions adds more value to the portfolio or avoiding uh, you know i would say foolish decisions kind of adds more value so so you know that that is the crux that is the context a lot of us try and spend you know too much time in trying to identify good businesses backed by great earnings great management and build that portfolio but you know one wrong mistake in the portfolio definitely hurts the portfolio but how much you know is that important how much it is important to actually avoid making mistakes so this is the you know context and to discuss this we have a fund manager utsav mehta who is responsible for managing one of the mid and small cap focused funds you know managed by edelweiss he has been you know part of edelweiss team for quite some time and he has been managing you know various other other funds also at the alternatives uh, uh, you know side of Ed edelweiss business he brings with him more than 12 years of total experience he is a cfa commerce graduate from mumbai university and has worked as an analyst covering infrastructure and construction sector in edelweiss capital before he became part of edelweiss so you know and he you know is kind of uh, i have interacted with him i can tell you the guy is passionate about only equities and investments he himself acknowledged that he may not be good in you know many other things but equity is something you know which he tries to learn every day and is his area of passion and hence i would not like to hold any further and would like to hand it over to him he has made a very interesting presentation and the intent here is to learn i reiterate and hence i welcome you all to this webinar over to you sir thank you so much kamal for uh, not only uh, inviting me to speak over here but also for a warm introduction uh, and it's also good to see so many familiar faces in attendance uh, it's good to spend a friday evening talking equities with friends who i may know or i may not know as well uh, so before we start off with today's presentation i just want to give you all a bit of a brief as to what i'm aiming for the idea for all of us as either portfolio managers or even self investors in the equity market we always spend a lot of time effort and energy in trying to find out which is the next best area to invest in but my years of experience have taught me that we do not always pay enough attention to what can potentially go wrong whether it be wars whether it be currency fluctuations these are things we speak about but we can never quantify and then when those events happen we end up losing a lot of money but there are ways and methodologies as as i will discuss in our presentation by which you can immunize your portfolio to some of these events right so uh, kamal if i could just ask you to put on the presentation on the screen and we can kick off sure wonderful so i hope that the screen is visible for everyone uh one small piece of request i have tried to trawl through as much data as i can for those people who are not fans of data uh don't worry i'm not a fan of data myself uh, there will be a lot of data shown towards you but i'll try to simplify it as much as possible uh the question that i'm trying to answer for you guys today and it's a burning question which has been debated for ages is investing a lot like poker or is it like chess and the reason why i started with this analogy is because there has been a lot of literature on this and a vast amount of literature aims towards investing being closer to poker however i personally believe that investing is a lot like chess and i'll explain the reasons why 
very rarely do we know what our conversion rates are. What do I mean by conversion rates, right? Uh, let's take any five-year period, right? Let's take a person, your aunt comes to you with a portfolio that they had bought five years ago, and they want, they want you to look at the portfolio and figure out whether the portfolio is done well, poorly, so on and so forth. What will you do? You'll, you'll benchmark it to a particular benchmark. You'll say, okay, this portfolio is delivered 2%, Nifty is done 10%. Okay, why is that? Because it has certain sectors which didn't do well. It has certain, it has more large caps which, which struggle. And you'll break the data up into many pieces, right? But typically what we rarely end up doing is actually just break up the, the companies into various kinds of performers, right? So I've just given you an example. Let's assume that you were just a very average stock picker, right? So you had one third of your portfolio that were multi-baggers, one third of your portfolio, which were average-ish companies which did reasonably all right. And then one third of the companies that did extremely poorly, right? We all spend a lot of time on the first one third. But as you will see in the example I've given below and given here and, in, in, and as we follow ahead, that actually for you to spend a lot more time concentrating on the last 33%, which is the losers club, right? That is what will end up helping you achieve outperformance rather than hunting for multi-baggers. Now, why do I say that? Uh, Kamal, if you may oblige me with some answers. Uh, I've just put in a small quiz over here. If you were to, on an average, pick NSE 500, right? So there are 500 companies in NSE. You are in the year 2016. I'm telling you, pick 20 random companies out of this NSE 500 and hold them for five years, right? Don't sell them, don't do anything. What percentage of them do you believe would have compounded at 15% CAGR? I've used 15% CAGR because that's what everybody realistically wants to earn, right? Uh, any guesses? I mean, I'm open to guesses on the chat as well. Hey, hey, 20%. 40%. Uh, and do you believe that the success ratio has increased or decreased over the last 15 years? Increased. You would think that with fixed deposit increased. rates going down, people, yeah. yeah. Increased. Yeah, the people, yeah, decreased. In reality, however, the rates have broadly remained the same. And one in three mid cap or small cap stocks actually end up delivering more than 15% returns. So how do you read this table in front of you? Just let's just focus on the last bar, which is 2016 to 21. This was the example Kamal that I gave to you. If you were an investor on 30th September 2016 and just randomly pick some number of large cap, some number of mid cap, some number of small caps, 28% of the large caps would have delivered more than 15%, 35% and 32% of mid and small caps would have delivered more than 15%. This, as you can see, over cycles changes, which means one of two things, which means your starting point is important. If you were an investor in 2007, right at the peak of the euphoria, your chances of conversion are lower. If you were an investor at the peak of despair in 2013, your chances of finding a 15% CAGR stock is higher, right? But leaving that aside, leaving that aside, let's just look at this number in mid and small caps of 30%, right? 30 to 36% on an average. It means that you have one in three chance of picking a stock that can potentially double over five years, right? Now, one in three is a very good number. If there are professionals like me sitting there doing this full time, you would think that almost every professional should have majority of their portfolio with stocks that actually deliver more than 15% CAGR. Then why is it that fund managers struggle to deliver 15% CAGR at portfolio level? So to answer that, let's come up to the next set of questions, right? Kamal, any guesses here? What percentage of stocks have delivered less than 0% CAGR over the next five years? Over the last five years? Over any five-year period. On an average, 25%. 40%. 40%. Uh, I would say 40%. 
Yeah. Yeah. So realistically, the answer is 40%. So while you have one in three chances of finding a multi-bagger with doubles over five-year period on average, 40% of mid and small caps across cycles actually ends up delivering 0% or lower, right? And in the end, your overall portfolio performance becomes a victim to this set of companies rather than your ability to find multi bankers. Let me, in fact, add another layer to this. 25% mid and small caps on an average deliver less than minus 10% CAGR over a five-year period. What do I mean by that? They decline in an absolute way by more than 40% over a five-year period. Just think of it. One in four stocks that you may randomly pick today will fall by at least 40% over the next five years. Right? So this data that we have is very compelling to show that while success rates are easy to find in a market like India, failure rates are also extremely high. Right. And for those statistically inclined, I have put 5000 iterations of companies over the last 10 years in this. And as you can see, the out underperformance, that is the left hand side tail is thicker than the outperformance tail. Now, why is this important? Right. And let's let's come to the, the crux of the matter of why I'm droning on about this. By simply avoiding stocks that have, forget declined or given less than 0% CAGR, by simply avoiding stocks that have fallen by more than 40% over a five year period, right? So just eliminating the absolute duds from your portfolio. If you just remove them and just take an average of the rest of the NSE 500 stocks, row two is the kind of returns you would make. And the final row, is the kind of outperformance that you will make over NSE 500. In 10 iterations that I've carried out in only one cycle, which was 16 to 21, where just by simply avoiding stocks that fell by 40%, you could have outperformed NSE 500 very easily and by handsome margin at that, right? So the kind of work sometimes that we do over here when we are trying to build a portfolio, in reality, we end up spending a lot of time trying to build an anti-portfolio. Stocks that we don't want, which we believe can fall by 40%. Now, this fall by 40%, by the way, can be one of two ways, right? Either it can be that you picked a bad company, which didn't deliver, and the stock price fell by 40%, right? The other is that there was a negative event. Stocks fell by 40% and you decided to book your loss, right? So just to give you a parallel example, we own Uber and Foodworks in our portfolio. Jubilant Foodworks since January of this, this year would have fallen by 35-40%, right? The test of avoiding minus 40 percenters is to avoid bad companies, but also not sell good companies when they actually fall 40%, right? So it's a double-edged sword, but it's important to do that. And which is why I want to close off this discussion by just pointing out that this is why I believe that investing is a bit like chess. In a game of cricket, if you score 400 runs in the first 49 overs and lose five wickets in the last over, you'll still end up winning. In football, if you're up 5-0 and you concede a goal, you'll still end up winning. Chess, you can be perfect for the first 24 moves. You can be flawless for the first 24 moves. Your 25th move is a blunder and you'll end up losing the game. Right? And therefore, I believe that investing is a lot like chess, where your aim should be to reduce blunders rather than just all the time going full throttle, trying to find companies that will outperform. So now I've, I've gone to gone on, droned on about the advantages of doing this. So now obviously your next question will be, so how do you, how do you do this, right? How do you find low return companies? But before I, I go on about how we do it, I want to also spend two minutes about certain misconceptions about low return companies. Most myths around the market stress on the fact that if you end up buying high earnings growth companies or high ROE companies, 
they will not fall by 40% over a five year period or they will not even fall at worst you will not lose money but here's an example right this is an example of the period 16 to 21 now this is a lot of data so i'll i'll go a bit slow just concentrate on the overall line right on nsc 500 overall between 16 to 21 32 percent of the companies delivered more than 15 percent CAGR. And 18% of the companies fell by more than 40%. If I had picked randomly out of companies that in the preceding five years, which is FI 11 to 16, right? Because when you're sitting in 16, you don't have the luxury of knowing what next five years will be. You have the luxury of only knowing what last five years are, right? If you were just taken out companies that have delivered revenue CAGR of more than 15% in the last five years and just picked amongst them, right? It's not like your conversion rate dramatically increases. You would have ended up picking 37%, which are more than 15% CAGR and 16%, which are less than, which decline by 40%. How about picking companies that had delivered 15% CAGR in profits in the last five years? Again, the conversion rate doesn't change much. How about ROE? Doesn't change much. In fact, even if you say that I will pick only from a pool of companies which have delivered more than 15% CAGR revenue, profits, and ROE of more than 15%, even if you combine all these three conditions, yes, your, your uh, failure rate remains the same, but your success rate of finding companies actually reduces, right? In fact, the only test, at least in general financial terms that I've found to work, is to just avoid high debt companies. Companies that have more than one-time debt equity typically ends up being a massive decliner rather than a massive winner. But the point that I'm trying to prove over here to financial analysts or portfolio managers such as me to come on TV and say that this is about earnings growth and it's about ROE, it is. It is. The best performers between 16 and 21 will be the companies with the highest earnings growth. But there is no way by looking at historical data and just crunching those numbers and saying that I have picked the highest quality companies based on the last five year or 10 year data. It just does not work. In the next slide, I've done a similar example for 14 to 19 and the results are broadly the same. Right? So here we are. I told you the importance of, of avoiding duds. I've told you why financial metrics, there is no quantitative way of finding out who these duds will be. So how do we go about doing this? Right? So there are three things that I want to speak about. Uh, what we do, what we don't do, and how we behave ourselves so that we do what we believe is the best for our clients. What we do do, right, is especially in the small and mid-cap space, we try to focus on established business models. I think this cannot be overstated enough. Many a times, most of us get carried away by the next big thing, by the next new tech idea, by somebody who's going to manufacture EV batteries in India and is probably going to become a multi-bagger. These are all unproven business models. I am happy owning Ipka who sells more pain medication than and is growing faster than anybody in a, in the Indian pharma market. The Indian pharma market is something that I've seen over the last 15 years evolving. I have data to Ipka has been listed for over 15 years. I have 15 years of data. Uh, Kamal today in our, Focus mid and small cap portfolio, we do not have a single company that is listed in the last two years. It's because we are uncomfortable by, by the fact that we do not have a long enough financial history to do forensics on. We don't know the promoters long enough or the management long enough to know how they behave during good times, how they behave during bad times. And when you are anyways taking more risk to invest in the mid and small cap space, it's important important for you to know these things and give them time. It's okay if you miss out on a couple of them. So be it, such is life. 
I've said one in three end up doublers over five years. I don't need to want every single one of them. But yes, established business models with a long enough listed history is something that we look for. It's a softer aspect, but it's extremely important. The other bit that we do on the company side, we like businesses where there is a lot of capital needed to be invested. Now, this is very contrary to, to what today's investing is like. Everybody wants asset light companies. Our problem with asset light companies is we love asset light companies as long as the management and the promoters are great. The problem with majority of the Indian companies is when they earn a lot of cash flow and they have so much money sitting in their bank account, they will inevitably and without quoting anybody or without quoting a particular company, they will end up doing something stupid. History is littered with bad mergers, bad acquisitions, bad capital allocation decisions, bad expansions. I, I, it's just, I can go on and on on this list. So we like companies which have access to capital, but, but at the same point of time, have so much more investment to do the, in their own business that they don't get any funny ideas. Another company in our portfolio, Relaxo, for example, right? Relaxo makes chappals. They've got so much capacity to put up year after year. If you see their capex number, if you see their working capital number, the core business ends up taking so much investment that they don't decide one day that, hey, I want to buy an airplane as well for myself. That's what I mean. Another bit which is unique about how we filter out some of these bad companies, we really like investing in companies that have made mistakes in the past and recovered from it. We do not look for flawless histories. Companies with flawless histories just means that they have mistakes yet to be made, right? Uh, similar example from our portfolio, IPCA. Uh, in retrospect, it turned out to be a mistake when they invested so heavily in trying to get a plant for US FDA. Didn't, I mean, faced problems. Company had a massive drop in profits somewhere around 15, 16. But since then, if you see the reaction of the company from those lows to to tacitly work hard, turn around that business and achieve the heights that they have today. Chola Mandalam. Chola Mandalam, the NBFC and Chola Mandalam Holdings, the holding company. Chola Mandalam was, is considered one of the cleanest NBFCs today, right? It's considered one of the best run NBFCs in the country today. But not too many people know that in 2008-9, they were on the verge of bankruptcy. They've turned themselves around and those ethos that they learned during those bad times is what's driving the success today. So we love companies that have made mistakes and recovered from it. Obviously, you have to take a judgment call of the quality of the management and whether they'll be able to continue doing it. But, but personally, we love that. Stuff that we don't do to avoid these mistakes. We hate calling ourselves small cap hunters. Unlike a lot of my contemporaries who do great work in this field, we do not claim that we will go out and find the next 2000 crore company, which will become the next two lakh crore company. We believe your percentage chances of finding that and making mistakes in that are extremely high. You want to make 15 to 20% CAGR returns over a longer period of time means you have to avoid anything that can go wrong. We also don't buy at any price. We do not like companies which are momentum plays. So we tend to avoid stuff in metals and agri commodities, simply where factors cannot be controlled either by the management. We just avoid. So that's what we don't do. And finally, to top it all off, we, we've put in robust systems and processes to ensure that we don't make behavioral mistakes. What do I mean by behavioral mistakes? At my own expense, let me be honest, I was very negative in April 2020. I thought this is going to be one of the worst meltdowns that we've ever seen. In retrospect, how wrong have I been, right? But what has really helped us in that period is that we have a list of aspirational companies that we want to own, right? Companies that we know will withstand any cycle. They were just too expensive for us to own. And there is a price point at which I know I want to own it. And that just lies with my trader. 
if the stock price were to hit that number, he's not even supposed to ask me. He's just supposed to buy the stock. And in April 2020, despite me being so pessimistic, we've ended up adding stocks simply out of sheer luck because we had that process in place. We are all always going to be slaves of bad behavior. It's hard for market participants to, to, to not make such mistakes. It's impossible for people with full-time jobs not in investing to not make these mistakes. So what I would request and the point that I do want to make is having processes to avoid these mistakes like SIPs is the most basic process that you can follow in doing this. Right. So follow your SIPs, make everything into rules. Don't try to judge. No, the president of the country will not know the, the fed chair doesn't know. Nobody knows. Stop trying to guess the direction of the market, put processes in place and follow them. Uh, just as a final bit on this, there are these two books that I've recommended over here. I typically don't recommend books, but these two books have shaped the way I think and will help you a lot in trying to, if you are an average investor, if you want to really learn about some of the mistakes that you make. Actually, 50% of our time and effort goes in trying to avoid behavioral errors rather than uh, factual errors. So yeah, uh, to close off, uh, thankfully for us, that has yielded some very good uh, results. Uh, Crystal has, has awarded us the second best fund in our category on a risk adjusted basis. I keep reminding people that it's risk adjusted because we tend to be very bit cap heavy. Uh, so yes, whatever I've just spoken about, thankfully, uh, with good fortune has worked out well for us and yeah, uh, spoken for a long time. So I think I'll just stop here in case anybody has any questions or Kamal in case you have any questions. Thank you so much for listening to me. Sure, sure. So I think, you know, this is, uh, the example that you gave pertaining to the jubilant food falling by almost 25, 30% and, uh, correlating it to the context of this discussion. Obviously, you know, uh, the, the context here is that, you know, keep holding good companies and keep, you know, avoiding the companies, you know, where the possibility of, you know, fall is more, but practically how to do it, you know, to understand this more with examples is what I would want you to kind of, you know, spend some time upon. So, uh, jubilant food is one, you know, you have talked about, I would, I would give you one more example, like Avas financiers. Now, this stock has also been falling, right, from 3,000 to all, already at 2,200. And then l, &L Technology Services, another, you know, example. So, we, we have seen some of yeah. the, and there are many more stocks that I can talk about, which are part of NSE 500 and maybe, you know, are part of those 40% numbers which are going to underperform or those 25% numbers that are going to outperform the basic 15% CAGR metric that you mentioned. But how to identify, you know, or uh, uh, say these, let's talk about these numbers. So, yeah. Yeah. So, Kamal, apologies. I won't be able to speak about Awas, not in our portfolio. So, compliance doesn't allow me. But I can talk about LTTS because it is. I can talk about Jubilant because it is. And those are two wonderful examples because we held them then. We continue to hold them in the portfolio today. Absolutely. And uh, to start, I would also like to give one disclaimer that all this is, you know, in the context of learning, nothing to be construed as an advisory. This is. From the context of trying to understand and correlating with them. Yeah. Yeah. So so look, Kamal, you're right. It's it's tricky, right? If it weren't jubilant food works, but it were any XYZ stock, which had fallen 40%. It's hard to know now whether jubilant will be considered a high quality company and will therefore recover five years from now or not, right? That's the judgment call that I've taken, which is why I continue to hold it. I think the way to go about this is, is twofold, right? One is you have to have to take a call on the quality of management, right? Uh, we spend a lot of time deconstructing financials and yes, that's a part of our core job, but remember the captain of the ship or the captains of the ship will always end up being the sole reason of your 
end location. What do I mean by that? There is inevitably things that are always going to go wrong in business, right? Businesses, unfortunately, unlike the way we see them on a quarterly basis, they aren't linear. They're like an organism. Some things go right, something goes wrong, somewhere some store is working, somewhere some store is not working. Uh, people are taking decisions, employees are taking good decisions, bad decisions. At the end of the day, a good management or a promoter family or an owner family ends up determining that even when bad things happen, they will be able to steer the ship, correct the problem and pivot. Which is why if you recall, I gave you an example that we like because now they've, they've shown to me over a 10, 15 year cycle that even if things go wrong, they have the ability to dust themselves off, reorient the business rather than continuing to sink bad money after good, right? So to answer your question, how do you differentiate? We work a lot on management quality and management intent. So when Jubilant Foodworks first fell by the first 30, 35%, we weren't too worried in Jan, right? All high PE stocks were correcting. There is this huge flavor in the market about high PE going to low PE. So be it. That's part and parcel of the game. However, what will what will worry us is if the CEO resign and they don't replace him adequately, right? Because he is the captain of the ship. When Mr. Pota came in 2017, he's turned around jubilant to what we know today, right? Profits have increased by more than 5x in this period, right? So jubilance an entity, they've learned processes, they'll be able to handle this excellently well. But I need to know whether the captain is, is the captain that they're going to appoint is capable enough, right? So don't worry about fall in stock prices, worry more about change in fundamental events and the quality of the people heading the ship. If it was a 40% fall in a PSU stock, and I'm not a fan, big fan of PSU stocks, I, I don't know whether I would have had the same confidence or not, right? Uh, as far as LTTS goes, again, right? It, market decided we don't want such high PE IT companies anymore. They moved away. Has fundamentally anything changed? Not really. Is the fact that 5G and improving uh, communications is going to enable higher IoT and smart smart sensors in everything that we use today? The answer is yes. Is LTTS the largest pure play uh, R&D company in India today? The answer is yes. Has the management changed? Have, have the horses who built the business still, still there? The answer is yes. I don't think I have to worry too much. And again, Kamal, I'm, I must say, right? I'm not here sitting in front of you saying that if you pick all my stocks, none of them will fall by 40% over the next five years. I can assure you that. No, I, I will also make mistakes. Hands up. We all make mistakes. The idea is to minimize them. And I know with the rules and the processes that I've put in place, we're working towards minimizing that. Right. So, you know, uh, the foremost question which anybody would ask any fund manager is the view on markets. But I would want you to kind of address that in the context of today's discussion. How important is it to actually understand the view on market before, you know, investing, especially in a year like 2022? And what should be the, uh, I would say, uh, focus of investor, uh, you know, before attempting investing into equities in this context? Lovely question. Uh... I'm not, I, I try not to have a view on the market. I, I honestly don't. There are, there are certain things that I feel deep down inside should be the direction that the market is going in. I, by nature, am not a person who lends himself very well to high PE stocks or expensive stocks. Valuations are an important subject for, for me. I don't believe in buying stocks at, or owning stocks at any multiple. But at the same point of time, I also recognize the reality that that stance itself has been wrong for the last five years, right? So if, if somebody were an investor today, I think the best thing 
to probably best way to probably circumvent this is to be process oriented about this right do your sips do your homework on the fund managers that you invest in because they are the guardians of your money right pick who you believe are the best four or five fund managers systematically invest in them because you do not know whether the market is going to go up by 20% in the next next one year or minus 20% in the next one year systematically invest in them review your holdings every once in a while and please i implore you especially at valuations where they are today the fact that interest rates are most likely going to go up from here you are not or no i can't say not but you're very unlikely to have the same free run of making returns the same way you did over the last two years right so you have to be patient with equity investments now more than ever in fact i've done this exercise where i have looked at index returns for holding it for one year two year three year four year five year all the way till 15 years all the way across history you you invested in sensex in 92 93 94 95 and you held it at di- different periods the one thing the one common theme that comes across is that you will always beat fixed deposits for greater than a 7 year investment so when somebody turns around and asks me what's up according to you what is long term i say 7 years right it sounds absurdly wrong it sounds like a very long period and and it sounds convenient for a fund manager to say 7 years to go theek hai you judge me by 3 years that is your lookout but in reality history proves that in the indian markets any equity hold held consistently over 7 years ends up beating fixed deposits comfortably at that so the only answer i would give is i personally don't believe next one or two years will be uh as rewarding as the last two years that does not mean they can't be rewarding because 15 to 20% in today's context is also good money but at the same point of time there is no way to know so stick to processes create review your holdings and be patient that's that's the only way to do this Yeah. Oh yeah, and and just to, to just to close this off, I invest my money in the same way. So this is genuinely like I'm putting my skin in the game. Sure. For for those who in the audience who don't know, we ourselves are not allowed to invest in stocks ourselves. Uh, so I also invest in mutual funds, and whether it was COVID or whether it was December two thousand twenty. 21 when everything seemed like a peak my sips have continued the same It just haven't moved at all sure so there is another fear which is you know currently prevailing in investors mind is on the one side there are certain high pe stocks which seem to be companies backed by secular earnings but yes because they are high pe stocks rise in interest rates kind of impacts their valuations but you know exiting those stocks now when we have already seen around 10 to 15% impact already happened on the valuations and on the other side there are a lot of mid and small cap companies in investor portfolios which have actually delivered very good returns and it seems like maybe you know if interest rate actually continue to keep rising these companies which are kind of more uh, living on the borrowed capital their earnings will come down and their margins will get impacted and eventually there could be a possible downtrend maybe even worse than the large caps and hence there is this uh, you know i would say confusion always in the minds of investors whether to kind of take money out of large cap and put that into kind of mid caps or whether to kind of book profits out of mid caps in this context how do you want to address you know in the current time when we know that interest rates are going to go up inflation is a concern valuations for large caps are high and investor portfolios are such that they have made brilliant returns in mid and small caps but their conviction to hold large caps is higher than mid caps despite you know greater returns made in mid caps there are kamal great companies in the mid and small cap space right uh, so the beauty about mid and small cap space is unlike nifty 100 which is what we particularly say is large cap right the first 100 there are 150 mid caps 
एंड देन देर आर टू फिफ्टी टू टू फिफ्टी वन से लेकर ऑलमोस्ट थाउजेंड तक वी कंसिडर स्मॉल कैप्स राइट उसके नीचे तो बहुत छोटा हो जाता है दैट पूल इज लार्ज इनफ दैट इफ आई एम अ फोकस फंड इन्वेस्टर विच इज द वे आई एम बिकॉज आई बिल्ड ट्वेंटी टू ट्वेंटी फाइव स्टॉक पोर्टफोलियो मुझे इन एविटेबली आई एंड फाइंडिंग गुड कंपनी on a quality basis will be on par with large caps simple example in front of you is jubilant or relaxo right you may consider them mid caps but realistically in quality ways they're no is worse off than large caps right so i don't think it's a question of should we run away to large caps or should we run away to mid caps i think there is there is a fear that high pe mein bubble ho gaya hai too many people ran for high pe stocks because they thought it was clean and therefore downside would be less the last 2 3 months have served as a reminder that that's not always true and now people are wondering what to do should i go to the cheaper stocks or should i stick to these high quality stocks look quality ka definition keeps changing we have a stock in our portfolio called polycap it wasn't considered quality till one year ago we have a stock in our portfolio called apl apollo it wasn't considered quality till 6 month till pre covid i remember nobody wanted to look at it thinking it was a steel steel uh, processor right so what is quality and what is not quality that market will decide and it will all look good in retrospect only so today sitting you don't know what quality is but what i implore a lot of people to do is if you believe that this company is doing good work in a sector that is growing fast right what do i mean by that again i'll come back to the jubi example because it's relatable to everyone fast food in india is growing faster than the gdp it's a fast growing market we all know that the company within that is gaining market share by adding more and more cuisines to its delivery right so it's it's entering biryani it's entering uh, it's entering chinese and and so on and so forth right so it's going to gain market share within fast food i right now and this can differ from person to person have the faith that this is a large enough organization process driven organization that can actually deliver on on this right once that is the case right then you have to hold on to the stock and don't worry because isme kya hota hai pata hai people will first get scared the news will come that high pe stocks have to go because interest rates are rising so people will sell eventually all of these people will be left with money 6 months later they will look for something to buy what will they end up buying companies that are showing earnings growth so gum fir ke the struggle in inevitably becomes that only to find growth so if you truly believe in it i wouldn't worry too much at all at all with with these gyrations high value moving from high p to value p and all of that these are just constructs that we make ourselves to find patterns but in reality these patterns don't exist over longer term i hope that that answers the question i'm not beating around the bush there no no right so as a fund manager you know uh, in terms of constructing the portfolio how much importance do you give to trying to understand the sector view or sector perspective or research or for example so uh, you know today 30% allocation uh, in nse 500 goes to financial services and uh, the mm-hmm. same number in nifty you know 50 is around 37% but the second right. is it which is around 13% in nifty 500 and 17% in nifty 50 so if if you know you're constructing your mid and small cap focused portfolio would you want to uh, keep this in mind that i want to keep certain companies from financial services and it and then maybe i will move on to other sectors you know just like we have the overall uh, allocation of the market or you would not want to kind of thing like that and only focus on businesses underlying earnings and mm-hmm. you know. so this was one of my biggest learnings when i joined the buy side right so when when i, when I was a when i was an analyst on the sell side i used to always say that are isme kya you have to find the 20 or your 25 best stocks put them in a portfolio and bang you're done right unfortunately it doesn't work that way so what we do is we try to strike a balance between both right so let me put it this way in my mid and small cap universe around 10 or 11% of of companies by weight are banks 
another six to seven percent are NBFC. So these are your traditional financial services, right? Lenders. I have to ensure that at least one to two stocks in my portfolio are lenders. I'm I don't take my decision based on the fact that mujhe satra taka ke aspas rehna hai because I run focused portfolios. I am not a mutual fund manager who hugs the index. But at the same point of time, I cannot completely ignore it. If cement is 4% or 5%, I I inevitably do ensure I have one cement company unless I have very serious reasons to believe that cement as a sector cannot get touched. And this exercise, this discipline, this process helps you over a longer period of time. And I'll, I'll throw back to examples in the past, right? Pre-COVID, who was excited by IT services in our country? Infosys was a 13, 14x price to earnings. TCS was a 20 times as considered expensive. These companies hadn't delivered 15% EPS EAGR for donkey's years, right? People thought that these are mature businesses, cash flow generating businesses, but not exciting in growth. And see what's happened thereafter. Which is why sometimes these trends are difficult to call even for us as fund managers. So we have these processes in place that was even if I'm completely wrong, at least I have one leg in the game. But once I have those one or two, then I'm not too worried about, okay, index has this much, so I need to be somewhere close to that. Then no. Then I pick my two favorite ones within that and just roll with it. Sure. And as far as the amount of time doing sector research, I've been blessed by doing the mid and small cap space. So most of my sectors are, are not even large sectors. They are niches of sectors. Uh, so it gives me a lot of time and bandwidth to hunt into things which normally you don't find in everyday research reports. So yes, uh, I'm just a research analyst in reality. And I spend 80% of my time doing sector and company research. And you, you, I mean, if, if we, if we are lucky enough to have this seminar 10 years down the line, I don't think that bit will change about me at all. Sure. So generally speaking, you know, from the perspective of a common investor, when he is made to think of a mid and small cap focused portfolio, he, you know, believes that this is a value portfolio. This is a general you know, thought process. This is how one always believes that a mid and small cap portfolio is a more of a value portfolio and large cap portfolios are more of a growth portfolio because, you know, large cap companies are expected to be more established and have a linear, relatively linear growth and mid and small cap companies are establishing themselves and hence, you know, their PEs are not very high and there is a scope of PE re-rating and at the same time, earnings are volatile. So in, in this context, you know, how is your portfolio and how should investors, you know, kind of perceive this differentiation between large caps and mid cap portfolios? Wonderful. So I'll answer this in two parts with the one part, uh, with the first part, I'll also answer a question that you asked earlier about high P stocks and rising interest rates, right? So this is one thing you can do this on a DCF, right? Just pure technical finance on a DCF, a high ROE company or a high ROCE company gets less affected by rising interest rates than a low ROC company. A high growth, low ROC company gets affected the most. So there is this misnomer that high P means bad because interest rates are rising. That is not true at all. If the company is generating 100% ROC on his business, he's generating so much cash flow that usko interest rate se kya karna hai? Wo, wo zindagi mein ek rupay ka borrowing nahi karega. Aaj, today Infosys has so much cash on his balance sheet. Okay, I'm not allowed to talk about it. LTTS has so much cash on his balance sheet. Does he really need to bother if interest rates rise? Not really, right? I mean, what difference does it make to them? So you can't just paint every company with the same brush. And for the second part, which is the part that you asked right now uh, about mid caps being riskier, more volatile in earnings, lower PE with chances of becoming large caps and large caps becoming more stable, more linear in terms of growth. I don't believe that that construct is true to a large extent in India at all, at all. 
you can and and you can do this exercise you can go to amphi's website you can download their nse 500 list and you can go through their top 100 companies list and you will find lots of metals mining companies which are highly volatile energy companies and at the same point of time you will also find a lot of mid and small caps which are in consumer businesses yeah a better way to think about your investment is not large caps and mid caps a better way for you to to be an investor is to basically take a call or or give money to the right person to manage i think i personally do a lot of focused funds uh and i pick the fund managers that i want to invest in and i think focused funds is the way to go go because whether it be large cap mid cap and small caps and I, and i showed the percentages in presentation there are very high failure rates even in large caps so no particular bucket is going to save you what realistically you mean by large caps are the blue chip large caps right uh, i can't name them so yeah blue chip large caps uh if you're an investor sure you're taking on more risk in mid and small caps i don't deny it at all it is riskier it is more volatile but over longer periods of time which means 5 years and plus the returns are always great so if you are a patient enough investor who's willing to lock away his money for a long period of time uh, rolling 5 year return charts would typically show the smid index or small mid cap index doing significantly better than nifty it's just about patience it, this is the behavioral element that we spoke about right the problem with mid and small caps are that in bad times like in 2018 they fall by 30 40% in a matter of 3 months right and then people get scared they remove their money and put it in large cap but that's not the time for you to do it sure. so be patient put your money follow your process forget about it for 5 years and trust me it works sure so you know today when jubilant food is down 30% and we are kind of advocating investors to be patient and at the same time you as a fund manager also practice patience based on your belief that yes management is great and there could be you know a couple of bad quarters because of known factors and the change in leadership eventually you know if it is right will take the ship to the next level now during this interim period of say a couple of quarters or three four quarters how to keep that patience what to what signals to watch i'm not i i'm not talking about from investor's perspective because investor has given this problem to you what but you know investor wants to know from you what do you do you yeah. are you sitting are you sitting idle waiting for ceo to be announced or you are actually doing some work in terms of going finding out and trying to be you know extra cautious and kind of taking that action proactively before market gets to know how how is your approach Uh, in in this period i i think you answered it for me yaar uh, so obviously i can't literally walk up to the board and say hey why are you not announcing the ceo so i think some part of it will be to wait for the new ceo to get announced to understand their vision i think the other bit is also that thankfully for us right now jubilant is going through a metamorphosis right like i said they're adding new cuisines they're expanding their product i think last quarter if i'm not mistaken was the highest store ad in their history right so so the, obviously they're going through a lot a lot is happening over there so for us as fund managers we're not sitting idle uh, our my analysts and me we're, we're we're on the ground we're we're meeting people who are executing these projects we're trying to understand from employees ex employees actually uh where the the challenges lie how how good the execution is whether the plans are going as per earlier set milestones that's the part that we do on ground and then there is a third bit we have is where internally on a very rough excel sheet no mega modeling but a very rough excel sheet we've set milestones that we believe the company should achieve to show reasonable progress towards adding new stores to their portfolio new cuisines to their portfolio now what do i mean by milestones we know that the roe will come down when they invest in new stores right but there also has to be a certain amount of store rate conversion in terms of revenue in terms of margin so we we've set ourselves the next 3 6 9 months when we speak to all of these people on the ground we ask them how should we think about this as a business and then we put some milestones so that every quarter with quarterly earnings 
we can understand whether the company is making a reasonable progress in this regard or not, or they're not. And if the answer is they aren't, whether it be 40% down or 30% up, it doesn't matter to me. A good executing business is a good executing business. And that's eventually what we want to do. Sure. So the particular PMS that you manage, which is mid and small cap, Edelweiss mid and small cap portfolio, you know, its last three year returns are closer to, I think, 25%, two year returns are close to 35%, and one year return is close to 30%. But obviously, last six months returns are kind of negative because in line with the fall, you know, of equity markets. At this juncture, we know it's a concentrated mid cap focused portfolio. Some of the stocks we've already discussed what is your you know kind of suggestion putting yourself in investor's shoe if investor is wanting to invest into equities how confident are you to kind of you know uh, accept money and what are the expectations that you want to set in terms of return the risk for investors or time horizon you know for an investor to come into your pms lovely lovely so am i comfortable accepting money right now the answer is yes Maybe in a more calibrated way, if if I honestly don't know how to time. So some people prefer doing it lump sum. Some people prefer to spreading it out to six months in an SIP processized way. Either ways is good. Are valuations expensive? Yes. Uh, are there companies which are, you, you should remember that last three years in India were pretty poor, right? So we were facing an economic slowdown even before COVID and then COVID sort of accelerated that. So in a lot of sectors, we're seeing companies sort of recovering from that. So there will be pockets where there will be earnings growth, even if the index doesn't go anywhere, right? And I'm a firm believer of that and which is where focus portfolios really help. Uh, what to expect in terms of risk and horizon of re returns? As of now, at least till December, January, market was in a very speculative phase. The amount of volumes being done in the market were seemed quite speculative in nature. We, we were not trying to participate in the hot stocks that are considered hot today, right? So I told you, we didn't participate in any of the IPOs. We just chose to stay away from that completely. But instead, what we've been doing is we've been hunting for managements who are using the flush of capital that has happened in the last year, year and a half to build credible plans for the next three to five years, right? Uh, then I go about validating how credible these plans are and how capable this management is of validating that. So to give you an example, something like a Syngene is setting up capacity for manufacturing. It's not something they've done in the past. It's, it's a very, very unique business. There is no scaled CRO in India barring Sinji. And they are putting up manufacturing capacity for the next three years. It will take three to four years to fructify. And that time horizon works perfect for me, right? Because I don't want to be with a management that's thinking, okay, so to answer your question, I am expecting investors to be patient and be at least three to five years right? Three years on the lower end. I know people get spooked when I tell them five, seven years. So I start with three years to make it easy on them. Uh, as far as risk goes, now is not the time to be uh, Rambo, uh, my movie references. But yeah, now is not the time to be Rambo. You're anyways paying I bleed valuations for, for most companies. There is a lot of hope built into many of the companies. Now is the time to be smart about your money. Money is made across cycles. In fact, if we can go back to that presentation, even investors in 2007, right? They had 15% chance of finding multi-baggers over the next five years. So there are companies, even if you're at the absolute peak, there are companies that will make you money. So don't be afraid of investing. Invest in a systematic way, but don't, now is not the time to be highly risk-taking. Like, like you yourself very correctly pointed out, there are companies that have been living on borrowed capital, haven't learned their lesson in the last two years because money was cheap and easy. That reality will dawn on to these companies. But at the same point of time, some companies which have executed flawlessly in the past 
will continue to do so. Uh, I think sky's the limit for many of them. Sure. My last question to you, you know, Edelweiss also has another very popularly known mutual fund, which is called recently listed IPO fund. Are you invested in that fund yourself? Yeah. Because you talked about not investing in some of these recently listed companies in your BMS. And at the same time, you mentioned that you are a fan of mutual funds. You are investing in a staggered manner. I am. I was an investor. Yes, I was. Uh, I had to remove the liquidity, a bit of a personal topic, but I had to remove the liquidity for some other personal reasons. But yes, I was an investor and I would have been an investor if that event hadn't happened. Sure. And hey, I, I, sorry, Kamal, you're, you're, you're asking me to sink both, right? No, I can't, right? Because like I told you, I also make mistakes and I have to account that I could potentially make mistakes. So I have to, I have to have certain amount of my capital allocated to the reality that I could have made mistakes, right? There's no denying that some of these recently listed companies are absolutely fabulous companies, right? They're just, there's no denying it. I don't invest in it because I just don't have a long enough track record and that's my style. This doesn't stop them from being fabulous companies and potentially great companies in the future. Uh, and if that's the case, then then hopefully that small investment of mine will be worth something. So uh, I always account in my own capital allocation, in my own personal wealth investment. I always account for what if I'm wrong on this and I keep some money for that as well. Sure. You know, I really like your honest submission that one does you know, go wrong. And at the same time, now when the valuations of some of these companies have corrected by 30, 40 percent, uh, are there any companies that you still like to add in your portfolio? You know, you, you may you, you may want to not name. Oh, but, <laughs> yeah. So if you're talking about specifically about some of these new age tech companies, yeah. uh, which have corrected by 30, 40 percent, my, my only challenge, Kamal, is that I really I'm still learning how to value it. Uh, these, so we've got incidents from the US. We've done a lot of internal work talking to some great professors from Western universities about how to value these companies and how they should be valued, how they're valued in the West. I just don't think in the Indian context, there is enough literature out there for me to be able to take a confident call on how to value them. So there are some absolutely stellar companies. I just don't know what the right valuation for them will be. And until I, I do, I'll wait for it. So just to give you a relatable example, four or five years ago, people did not understand insurance too well. They found it a very complex sector to invest in because it is a very complex sector to invest in. But now four or five years, multiple sell side brokerages cover it. There are multiple analysts who go deep into it. They can explain to you how it works, how you need to understand the sector, how you need to value the sector. I think these new age tech companies will also go through their own learning curve within the Indian market. Where I, when I, as a fund manager, feel ready that, yes, there is enough information out there for me to take a reasonably good call on these valuations, that's the time when I would start looking at it. Right. Thank you so much. So it has been really, you know, good conversing with you. Before we end, I would just like to, you know, give one piece of caution to, you know, some of our viewers who may watch this, watch this video. And I will just give you, you know, the context also to this question to you also, uh, sir. So we as a, uh, you know, platform, PMSAF World, uh, you know, publish a lot of reports as well as data analytics regards to portfolio portfolios of portfolio managers like you cross the market cap and this data also covers the stocks the names of the stocks the allocation percentages of the stocks so every portfolio has a line of thinking but out there there could be many investors there could be many you know young investors especially who may kind of want to create their own portfolio trying to pick few secular businesses from the large cap stocks and few new age businesses from the special situation oriented portfolio or mid cap put stocks from your portfolio and create their own portfolio now this is a very risky way to kind of you know uh, do it and hence we strictly say that we should, one should not do that because every business it may be good it may be bad goes through certain phases and hence you know one portfolio that is being managed by a portfolio manager has a one line of thinking and is kind of you know aptly maintained in terms of allocations and weights and type of businesses so all those investors who try and do that, you know, should do that at their own risk. We do not propagate that. And hence, you know, all this discussion that we have been doing 
is only for education purpose we strongly suggest that investors should give their money to professional fund managers or portfolio managers rather than trying to do it on their own thank you very much uh, for and, uh, sorry kamal i'll just i'll just add a standard disclaimer from my end sure, sure. any company that we've spoken about today is not a recommendation to buy them at all so i mean i have to say that that's what my compliance team no, told absolutely. me so, yeah. absolutely absolutely right so thank you so much everybody for logging us today thank you thank thank, thank you for having me kamal appreciate it pleasure